here. I like to do that because then you can easily upload it to YouTube. Okay, we are recording. Okay, great. Thank you. And then um, I guess maybe the best place to post this recording would be in in the maybe in that same announcement that's up right now that says "Remember the meeting." I okay. mean, change the title to uh, "See the the recording" or something like that. Okay. Because I, I don't really want to put it in one of the modules. So um, we were really excited to see this. I'm going to go ahead and just start this slideshow. This is interesting, Kim, because I've never like co-hosted with anybody before. <laughs> so this is kind of a little trial for us. So um, I made this a little bigger. If it's too big, let me know. Um, and here, this is just a, um, a course design rubric crosswalk, comparing the, the version that from uh, December 2016 to the one that just came out this October. Um, and yeah, it's a little big. So, oops. Um, the, the rubric, the original rubric was developed in 2014, so it has been four years. Um, when, since I started as a reviewer and um, I can go ahead and answer the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're hoping to roll it out this month, Carmen. Uh, I mean, right away, but as far as being used for, for reviews, um, I think it's going to be happening this, this month. They were waiting for some approval from, I forget which section of OEI. Um, so, um, as soon as that, and that was pretty assured, and as soon as that happens, then they can start, we can start using it for reviews. So in 2014, um, we had a different kind of rubric. I'm going to go to the next slide, and I don't know if you can see this very well, but up here at the top is our original rubric that I remember using, and it was a real kind of a real pain, actually. We, the, the reviewers didn't develop it. The, the a work group comprised of all kinds of different people involved in, in uh, distance ed across the state uh, had a hand in, in developing it. So if you're not going to be, um, if you don't have a question or something, you can go ahead and just mute your microphone. Click on that little uh, microphone icon at the bottom left and then unmute when you have a question. So it was really hard. It was a little unclear. We had to put points in um, and, and add them up and they had to get so many points for each section. It was just really kind of a, a pain. And so um, in, in 2016, a group of leads got together for three days and worked really hard in groups. And then we come together to develop this, this new rubric that would be um, easier to, to work with. And uh, we worked pretty hard on that. And so then now the most recent set of updates, as they say here, the, the, this is cut off even in my original one, but they're not major, uh, major changes like, like uh, from this one to this one, but they are uh, changes to help clarify um, how to really how to use the rubric and to clarify things for both instructors and for reviewers. So um, here's what their intent was. And this was, we, we all were solicited to give feedback after a group of people in OEI worked on this for quite some time on the changes. We were first asked what changes did we see necessary as reviewers, you know, what sections were maybe a little confusing or weren't as clear. Um, and so, but, and, or where were there redundancies? So that's what this new rubric does. It eliminates redundancies where multiple elements refer to the same issue. Whoops. And um, in update language in section B, the communication section uh, to more closely align to title five and add some, some services to student services that are needed for equitable student access. Some more explanatory text and examples for users to avoid confusion, and that's particularly true in the section D, I think. Corrections to punctuation and grammar and kind of streamline and improve the accessibility section. And I think this bottom part is supposed to say make it easier for colleges and um, 
reviewers to use. Um, so I'm not sure about that, Carmen, but uh, when we get to section B, Kim's gonna talk about that part. I'm gonna go through section A right now. Um, so this is the differences between the last version released in December 2016 and the latest ones released just this month. And so it's not a detailed list of every word or punctuation change, just really meant to bring attention to the more significant changes that might affect how the rubric is used. And I don't, I think I posted the rubric or a link to the rubric in the, uh, the um, Q&A discussion forum in an answer to someone's question. I don't think I posted it anywhere else, so maybe we can put that into the announcement as well. But it's, it's at online network of educators.org or cbc.edu. You can see it. And I've got it here too. I can bring it up and we can take a closer look at it um, as well. So here is the information page and how that's changed. Um, it's more streamlined now. Uh, we removed P2 since a second peer reviewer is not always uh, used in a, the review process. And so we replaced the jargon with more clear, with clearer labels, you know, peer, um, accessibility, self uh, review, or, or a lead review. And, and then just through the reviewer name, whereas on the old form it has a reviewer name and then it has a spot for the lead reviewer. So we just have a, a um, space here for the lead reviewer name. And then the aligned selections here. I think it looks a lot better. And, I thought there was a new question. I like this a lot. The, the table of the sections at the beginning of the rubric were rearranged and, that, and so things were chunked into related ele elements, you know, or chunk related. <laughs> related elements were chunked into meaningful groups. So I think that this, this, this looks a lot better. The content presentation, uh, interaction. Um, thanks. Carmen says it looks good. Um, in the assessment and accessibility. Teresa gave me feedback on my course. She seemed to be a little bit annoyed. What? Was somebody talking to me? Okay. All right, so um, can you guys see this okay? I know it's not really that very big. That's why I made it a little bit bigger. So. And we see this sheet kind of couldn't. You guys, will you need to mute your microphone, please? Yeah. Um, Mute, mute your microphone so that we're not hearing your conversations in the background. Thank you. Okay, so um, here's how it looked before. I um, put my computer glasses on to see this, even with making it bigger. So this is a, a change that I think was, was really a nice one to make um, instead of just the language was changed a little bit uh, from units, modules, just to individual learning units. Um, and they took out this piece about that objectives are included in, in assessments because that, that really belongs in section C. And just and change that to objectives are consistently placed and easy to locate in each learning unit. I like that a lot. Because this one, it seemed like so many instructors were, well, what does that mean? And, um, and it's just, it, it's not really, doesn't seem to really belong in the content presentation section. And then down here in A3, which previously said unit content and activities are aligned with unit objectives, um, that was clarified into this um, uh, criteria here, into this mm -hmm. language. Content is clearly aligned with and sufficient to meet the learning unit objectives. So that's just a, a little bit change in language for clarity. This is A1 through A3. So what happened here is, I'm gonna move my little toolbar, I can't see anything. Um, A7 and A8 were grouped with A4 and A6 since they all review how the CMS is used to aid learning. So the, the name of A8 and some wording was changed to more accurately reflect what's, what's being reviewed, the use of multimedia in that element. And I wanna go back to this also. Also what I like is they've added a subtitle to these sections. 
this one unit objectives, this one use of the CMS. And <clears throat> A5, um, just the language has changed a little bit. It's, it's the same, uh, you know, content being uh, pre presented in modules or learning, distinct learning units. And, and this was changed a little bit for, for clarity sequence to reduce cognitive load rather than all of this other language. And so uh, the page level chunking is the same and the effective use of, of um, CMS tools. And this A8 being renamed as effective use of multimedia um, really helps to, I'm trying to see, where is that over here? I think they might have brought it from a different section. I'm yeah, let's see. Okay, it's been a long day. But there was, this is something that came up during our review, Patrick, um, and I can't remember which one it was in. Um, uh, It's great that they've clarified that because mm -hmm. um, before, if a person was only using text-based content, that there wasn't really a clarification that that was not enough, that there needed to be a variety. So I really appreciate that. Yes, it was, it was the criteria that had, that had to do with um, using, having mostly text or, or, yeah. So it really does clarify it and, and it is the variety. That's what it is. This was the, the original one was A8, which they didn't include in here. <laughs> I don't have the original rubric open on my computer. I just have the new one. The original one had to do with, um, I think it said uh, it's, it's incomplete if it's mostly just text and it's aligned if it includes a variety of, of um, media. So that they changed the name of it and that it's used creatively throughout the course to facilitate student-centered learning, um, ways, ways that it might be used, not just having um, a video and, and some nice images, but, uh, but used so that students can interact with. Um, Teresa, the comment was, it was student-centered teaching is what the heading was. Okay. Rather okay. than, effective use of multimedia. So the old one said student-centered teaching as, as the A8. Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree, uh, Carmen, that create, creatively can be subjective. So, I mean, in, in part, that is something that, that reviewers have to determine. So I, I don't know what the answer would be. And, you know, maybe change that adjective, but they left that, they left that in. And I, and I think it's probably, could be maybe made a little bit clearer that it has to, has to do with things that students interact with and and you know I don't know but that's that's a good point. So um, for learner support, okay. So this one was used in the CMS. This is now subtitled learner support. Um, A11 was grouped with A9 through A10. And they provided examples for A9 incomplete to aid reviewers. And the name of A10 was changed as well to better reflect the intent of that element. So with A9, so they gave some examples of what uh, working with instructions for working with course content looks like, can look like. What are examples of it? Links to articles are provided without any guidance for how the student should work with, with the um, or videos with the material. And that this includes instructions for learners. Um, A10, it was changed from an individualized learning to learning support. <clears throat> and basically the criteria is the same. Having remedial activities to support basic skills or resources for advanced learning. And they changed numerous individualized learning opportunities to frequent, so. Um, that was the only change there. When I was getting um, courses reviewed, the instructions, I had good instructions for all my assignments, but what the 
uh, instructions here refer to um, including instructions for videos or articles or documents um, was that the instructor specifically guides students to, uh, in, for example, if a video is embedded in a module, why do you want me to watch this? What might the content be here? And how does it relate to the assignment so that everything is really clear on every page and in every activity that they're doing? So that was really helpful to me because I hadn't really thought about that before. I thought that if, as long as I had my instructions on the assignment, I didn't need to include the instructions with the video as well or, or things like that. So yeah, it's nice sure. if they clarify yeah. that. Kim, uh, Kim has had several courses approved by OEI, several, more than several, I think. <laughs> so she's been through this process numerous times. And yeah, that's, that's a good point. And, and, and all, yeah, I think also like, what do you want them to do? You know, what do you want them to do with that video? But I think that, that, that makes sense to me. How does it relate to mm -hmm. the module, to what they're learning, to the learning unit? I like that. And then, um, so institutional support, A12 to A14 were grouped together. A12 was more accurately re renamed course policies and uh, examples of student services were changed to include online tutoring, counseling, online readiness. These are all things that, that, that um, OEI really wants to emphasize. Um, Well, Carmen asked the question, should the instructor explain how students need to view the video and what to note to have it help on the assignment? And yeah, and Kim has a good answer. Yeah, just even just a, a one sentence overview. And then think about, I always uh, mention to instructors, think about what you want them to do with that material. You know, do you want them to take notes? Do you want them to uh, look for a, a specific section or take particular note of a certain area? And I really like the whole idea of, of connecting how it relates to what they're learning as well. And if, if this instructor, and this is something I hadn't done at first, and I'm still working on some of my courses to add them, but when in section A earlier, if they've added a learning objective to each module or each assignment, then that provides that extra instruction or kind of connection to is this, this video is going to help you complete that objective by doing these certain things. So the, the, uh, one other thing that was pointed out to me by distance, the distance ed coordinator recently was because so many students are starting to use their phones to um, access assignments, or they're not necessarily going to an overview page that lists all the elements of an assignment, that it's really important that all those instructions are included on the assignment page as well and not just in an overview overview area because yeah. there I've even had students where I've um, missed this and they're going to an assignment on their phone and not all the information's there it's like oh well what page number is that from and I realized that I hadn't put the reading on the assignment page it was on the overview page but not on the assignment page so really the more detailed you can be the easier it's going to be for them to access the information and complete things without extra cognitive load there's another question I'll let you look at that Kim while I continue on here um, that's such a good point um, so student services they added on this, this I already said that um, and technology support was grouped in here that, and one thing that I like that they took out because so many instructors even though I think it's important to be able to communicate to students that you can communicate how can you support the technology and, and so many uh, instructors maybe haven't made that really clear or specific. I even didn't add it until just maybe a few years ago to my syllabus and then to my um, or orientation module that has sections of the syllabus in it is that what I can do. Like I can maybe help a little bit with the PC, but I don't know anything about a Mac. But then at the same time, provide them with that technology support, explain it to them and give them those links or the contact information uh, where they're easily found. And you know, I, I think it's really useful to have a, an orientation module. And I suggest that um, to, um, I suggest that to, to instructors because it's sometimes if you have everything in the syllabus, that is great. It's great to have a very detailed syllabus that spells it all out. 
but and every time a student wants to go back and and find out something about your grading policy or the technology links for support, then they would have to go find the syllabus and scroll down and find that a section. I found it really easier to put those important sections in the orientation module, just that information where they can just access it anytime throughout the course. So now we're on, we're gonna go on to, into section B. So are any other questions about what you saw here for section A before we move on? Okay, we're just looking at this question. Oh, okay. Okay, are you ready, Kim, to, to move into yeah. B? And I don't know if you want me to stop sharing so that you can, do you have this open? Can you see my arrow moving on the screen? No, I would have to stop sharing and then you would have to share. Okay, so yeah, maybe we should do that just okay. for clarity's sake. Yeah, then that way you won't have to give me these little instructions if you want to go back and forth. Okay. Okay, now let me figure out. Uh, I see pause share, but I, oh, I know, I need to get out of here. I'm trying to out of this view of the PowerPoint. It's not oh, okay, so if I clicked on share, it says this will stop your screen share. Okay, go, go ahead and do that. Okay, let me see if I can find <laughs> rubric. Thanks for your patience, you guys. We haven't co-hosted before. All right, good job. Okay, okay. so um, from current slide. It's, uh, there we go. Oh, that, I don't know if you want I to make split my yeah. screen. Perfect, perfect. Um, I, are you guys seeing a split screen here? I, I, see, I see both. Um, I see both of the... Um, Oops. I'm not sure why it's splitting the screen up. I wonder if... It's not, I don't think it's splitting it up. It's showing the slide, I think, of the two sections to side by side as it is in the slide. Oh, really? On my screen, it's um, split, so... Oh, somebody else said yes, it is, huh? So let me try that again. I'm going to stop the share and then okay. see if I can get this to go correctly. So this might work. It's still doing it. I'm sorry, guys. I don't see a split screen. It, was, it looks good now. Hmm. Well, I don't know if, any, if you're having trouble seeing. If you do see a split screen, it's definitely smaller. But um, I'll, I'll go over it here, and I might have to get a little closer to see it myself. Um, so here, you see that pre-course contact has stayed the same. But you can notice, again, that's more streamlined on the right side. So what they've done is have combined um, B2 and before, they've taken out technology support, which we saw was in the A section now, and that's because it doesn't fit here. This, this section is all about instructor contact, student contact, and technology support doesn't really belong there. So they've put it where it belongs, and this whole part mm -hmm. focuses on regular and effective contact. And any of you who have been recently through the accreditation pro process knows that, um, they're specifically looking for this substantive contact in our courses. And so that's why they've changed this wording here to better reflect Title V. So regular effective contact instead of instructor initiated for the title, but you can see that instructor initiated contact is still within this criteria here. So that's still an important part of it. Um, we've just got that different title. And then the change here is interesting because instead of instructor contact info, which is what this is really about, the title is student initiated contact. And what that's for is to make sure that not only are instructors including multiple ways for the students to contact them, but they're also encouraging the students to initiate that contact and letting them know that they're available through text or through Zoom meetings or online or in their office or however, so that students feel comfortable approaching them and know that the teacher will, will be there to um, help them. Um, any questions about that? I don't know if I have my, my chat has disappeared. Maybe you can look at those if there's any. 
and let me know, Teresa. So if we move on to the next section, again, this is streamlined. We've got three elements instead of four. And let's see, what was I going to say? So this is delineating, um, instead of just student-initiated interaction, it's defining it being interaction with other students. So before it was student to teacher interaction, it was focusing on that. And now it's focusing more on student to student interaction and making sure that those opportunities are available. And the change here is just giving a little bit more detail. So instead of student initiated interaction contributes to a student centered learning environment, it says the course makes a variety of tools and methods available for student-initiated interaction to accommodate a variety of communication styles. So for an exemplary element, what that would be doing is not just including discussion boards, which is a great way to develop that sense of community, but perhaps it's, it's talking about multimodal modal opportunities, perhaps something like Flipgrid, where they're getting a chance to respond to each other um, with video feedback or a writing workshop where they're having a partner to look at and critique their work or other collaborative group work that would be um, exemplary if there were different elements incorporated in there. So it's really nice to have that clarity, um, especially when you're reviewing the course and you might even forget, like, what do I need to look for for this exemplary element? It's a little more clear there. But Carmen mentioned in the chat that peer reviews could be included in that. Yes, um, the writing workshop or the peer review um, is a great tool for, for that. So um, discussion boards are always encouraged in an uh, online class, but when you have these, if you can add like one or two other things even to get the students interacting in different ways. Or another thing is um, just having student to student boards uh, maybe brainstorming about their upcoming research project. What are you doing and what are some of your ideas and have some uh, rules around that that's helpful for students instead of it always being one format where it's just um, the same instructions every week, a little different ways to interact. And then B5. So um, B6 and B7 on the left were combined to create B5 on the right. And student to student interaction and learning community are both intertwined and create regular effective content among students. So um, it is, it's saying that it's, this interaction is designed to facilitate a community among learner, learners, which is ideal, and really those go hand in hand together. So that just kind of streamlined the language there. And again, um, the title and some of the wording, even though there are slight changes, they do reflect the Title V um, law more clearly. And I know Carmen had asked something about um, accreditation, and the rubric doesn't necessarily address this, this accreditation in the same way we might think of it. But if all these items are in place as far as teacher to student um, initiated contact and feedback and student to student interaction, then the things that accreditation are looking for are going to be in good shape, you know, that's what they want to see is, is all these elements incorporated in the course, so. Kim, Carmen has a question from the chat. What kind of moderation has to exist on these student boards? Mm. So um, are you talking about teacher to student interaction or, or moderating the students' comments? I think that's what she meant, which I think really could be up to the individual instructor, no? Mm -hmm. I always make sure to conclude, you know, that's part of their grade is that they're responding respectfully to other students. So that's part of their rubric. And I know things can flame up. <laughs> it hasn't happened to me, but I have heard it happen before to another teacher. So um, those are things you have to deal with as you come to them, I think. Has anyone else had a problem with that online? I know um, our distance ed coordinator recently is teaching a class where the student was <laughs> creating a syllabus for an assignment and put very inappropriate language in the syllabus. Um, it was 
just ludicrous. And she had to address that and actually go to the dean and everything because of the student's language. But it seems like, you know, hopefully that's pretty rare. Um, beyond, beyond here, does anybody have any questions about section B? So there's, there's a couple of comments in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know who, okay. Pauline says it depends on the purpose of the discussion and Margaret says not personally, but there's been at least one case of bullying in the discussions at our campus. Wow. Yeah. How were those handled? Is it like a two strikes are out or is it people or teachers going to the dean and adjusting it or? Well, I know that we had to get our, um, our student life, uh, there was like a grievance process that was, that was gone through. We, we, they follow regular protocol of, um, of behavior and discipline or sanctions mm -hmm. as it would be with a face-to-face -face class, but it, it really is kind of a can of worms to make sure that we have some kind of rubric and etiquette talked about in the discussion boards. Yeah, I, you probably do this, but I know we always put that in etiquette um, as part of the orientation module and they have to answer questions about netiquette in their syllabus quiz to start out just so that they are informed ahead of time that that's how they should be behaving but yeah, it seems like the office, but it's good to just put out there yeah i know it seems like common sense i teach an english 1c course which is critical thinking and they're approaching a lot of really controversial issues um so so far so good but Definitely, I think that can get out of hand pretty easily, depending on the student. So um, I noticed to Teresa in the D section that there was only really the, those two they showed us, right? There's nothing really beyond this. It goes, oh no, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's just D2 one and D2. So what I liked about this was, um, well, I think, yeah, they didn't show us the whole thing, but it's in the rubric, and then we could bring the rubric up if, um, if we wanted to. Um, but go back down to that next slide where it shows the, um, the examples. The next, the 16? Yeah. So, but this is what I really liked about this, because I think this is helpful for, um, you know, instructors and for reviewers. Although the course design, rubric um the course design reviewers don't review for section d when we first started out we did um what we could because we we you know didn't have the the training to to do a thorough section d review um but we went over it at first and then i think it went to an accessibility reviewer as well but that's really changed a lot but i really like these examples it's kind of hard to see here but um, they give you examples of what, what this means and how, you know, how it looks and little, like kind of little check boxes here. So that, that was one of the things that I thought was an improvement in section D. And you, even though as reviewers, we don't have to monitor this as instructors, it's really great information for us to know as we, um, create our content pages that we're doing it correctly in the beginning and don't have to go back and fix for accessibility all the time. Okay, so there's a, see a question here from Colleen. Are reviewers responsible for reviewing documents outside the course but are linked to in the course? That's a good question. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of courses use the um, uh, you know, publisher content. So as far as I know, we are not responsible for reviewing that, but there may be some things that if we can't, if they don't have enough content within their course, it's all publisher content, that we can't say that, that a section is aligned in some cases. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I do think that the accessibility reviewers are re request access. Is that correct? Do you know about that, Kim? Mm -hmm. Re request access to the published material. So it's usually up to the A team to d discover if the outside resources are accessible. But as far as a regular reviewer, the issue you might face, and this happened to me when I was reviewing the course, is that because it was all an outside resource that I couldn't access, I couldn't necessarily tell if the assessments were aligned with the material 
and and such. So and then Carmen brings up of how how it relates to the the objectives, you know, too. And mm -hmm. Right. A lot. There are a lot several areas of the rubric that can relate to that. However, many instructors and many really good online courses that I've seen have have content within the the LMS and enough to know that that it's aligned with in that area at least with the rubric or not and use the publisher content for practice you know which is what really it's basically designed or best used as in in my opinion for practice and some learning but not just to do all their learning there without anything from the instructor i guess is what i'm trying to say Welcome, Colleen. So any questions or comments about any of this so far? Have you have you had a chance to look at how the rubric, what the rubric looks like? Anybody? Colleen has. Okay. Well, we've been going for about um, 40 minutes. I don't know if I want to make the recording any longer because the, everyone can take a look at the rubric on their own I think mm -hmm. we just post a link to it there um, or you know put the document there maybe in the in the um, um, announcement <laughs> it's been a long day so thank you guys for for coming in and and I we you know like to hear your comments or if you look over the rubric and have any questions or comments Please post in that uh, pregunta. I'm uh, sorry, that's in my Spanish class. In the Q and A discussion, um, and you know, take a look at those questions that people post too, and see if you can help help each other. If you have any insights or knowledge about things, Is there a class in here? yeah, wow. so we are excited. So um, thank you guys, and I guess that we should just probably end this meeting, Kim, so that the, your video will process. Okay. And thank you for for doing that, which I guess because you were the first one in and were co-host that that's why why it had to happen that way